get this started. Today's discussion, um, I have a grab bag of, of different things, and a number of these build on elements we talked about last time. So specifically uh, issues of stochastics and this notion of a 2D histogram that we discussed last time, this, uh, this histogram over, or set of histograms over time um, that we examined for the case of stochastic variability and for summarizing model results given this variability. Um, so we're going to be returning to that but with, uh, with that tool, um, with an eye towards sensitivity analysis, doing uh, one-way and multi-way sensitivity analyses um, today. We'll see how that that's supported within any logic um, and how that same uh, Monte Carlo 2D histogram plays a role for examining regular systematic variation in parameters, exploring a parameter space given systematic variation, and also for, for random variation, for drawing parameter values from distributions. So that's, that's sort of the first topic we'll be talking about. Um, as time allows, and I, I think it probably will, because I'll, I'll go through this pretty quick, building on last time, um, we're going to be talking about building hierarchical models. So these would be models um, of situations where you've nested hierarchies. Um, and uh, you may have, for example, a, um, a class which is of individuals which uh, are in a classroom and that classroom is in a school and that school is in a neighborhood and that neighborhood is in a city or what have you. Now, um, I'm not saying you need all those levels but um, certainly researchers have found that, that articulating these different levels of structure often lends support a significant insight. Um, among other things, these different levels sometimes have different dynamics associated with them. Um, you know, rules for um, who's admitted to the school, for example, may be quite different from who happens to be the things governing who happens to be in a class. There may be certain structural regularities at each of these levels that's germane for understanding the results. And by building a model that captures these regularities, we can both describe the problem more neatly than we could in a purely one single level model and we can also examine statistically, for example, um, <laughs> phenomena at different levels in a way that might be amenable and might allow us to match data, for example, glean through things like multi-level statistical analysis, so hierarchical linear modeling, et cetera. And yeah. so, for example, um, something like a uh, command control structure, yeah. where I have different rule sets that yeah. are applicable at the various levels. Absolutely. This is very much better. Yes. So yes. Yes, and, and I should note that um, uh, that here we're, we're not necessarily dealing with n purely nested hierarchies. In other words, it could be that you have a very hierarchical um, decomposition where there's no overlap between different classes and so on. But you may, in fact, have some overlap between different classes, and you may have, you know, some some children who um, who are in go between two different schools, I don't know, for different years or what have you. It, it's not to say there's a rigid hierarchy, but we're going to examine a simple case where there's a straightforward nested hierarchy. And one of the one of the things that this brings out, and it's not entirely obvious until you really start thinking about how things are described, is is the virtue of an agent-based way of describing things lends it lends itself to describing these nested hierarchies. Because things that are nested in the world, people live in neighborhoods, and neighborhoods are located in cities, and cities within larger jurisdictions like provinces or states, um, those, those find uh, an exact mirror in terms of an agent-based description where you have different levels of agents, and so you may have um, individuals of people at the lowest level, and then you might have a description of a neighborhood, which could be captured actually in an agent. And those people um, who are within the neighborhood in the world we're trying to model are themselves contained in, or references to them are contained within the neighborhood within the model. So you have this kind of nesting in the model that exactly mirrors the nesting you see in the world. This is rather different than if you tried to impose it with, um, with vectors of values or if you tried to kind of flatten it in a way that you might um, to, try to, uh, to try to deal with it in an individual based system dynamics model. Um, 
where you have um, subscripts associated with different stocks. Each of those subscripts represents a particular person, for example, and you have some sort of um, sense that, okay, these people are associated with this neighborhood, those people are associated with that neighborhood. There's really no nesting that occurs there in the same way you see in an agent-based model. In an agent-based model, you have this very transparent nesting, and it allows you to articulate questions at each of those levels that then make use of information at lower levels where needed. So we'll, we'll see some of that, and it comes out rather nicely. Okay? So it's, we'll see a very simple example of that, but it's a principle that generalizes quite, quite readily. Um, and we'll see that fortunately, any logic affords us a very nice language for describing these nested situations. Yeah. That's right. And so, um, for example, the, uh, the dynamics at that very highest level might be uh, described in a stock and flow sort of fashion, but some of those um, flows might in fact be driven by aggregations of information of things that are occurring at the lower level. For example, totaling up the number of individuals who have been admitted to the hospital within the past week at an agent-based level of description might lead to a flow at the higher level that then drives sort of overall decision-making and policy setting. In the way that Chris referred to last time, for example, might change admissions policy guidelines. And so you might have aggregation um, mechanisms that, that summarize or observe sort of parts of lower level behavior and then um, use that information at the higher, in the higher level dynamics and vice versa you might have you know, things implemented at the higher level that then impact the population of agents, the selection of that population or their behavior at the lower level. So it's not to say they're totally, um, uh, totally disjoint solitudes but they are um, uh, they're best described with or thought conceptualized often with sort of different formalizations and it's nice to have that flexibility. So um, we uh, may return to that point, although not today in a hierarchical context. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so those are two things. And then as time allows for the methodological components, I have some additional material which seeks to um, deepen some of the um, points raised last time with respect to these example models we saw and with respect to the Java statements that we kind of did, a, of which we did a whirlwind tour um, and uh, would I think be helpful for understanding some things. So I have some material on exception handling and then I have some material on um, how to orient you what it is and why we do it and how it bears on any logic. And then I have some material on, um, on methods and, and, and sort of uh, uh, motivations for why you build them and, and how you go about defining them, sort of like we did in the intermediate level model last time. Okay, so um, it's an aggressive agenda. We'll see how far we can get, but um, we'll we'll certainly have a lot to go through. Okay, so um, the first part of today's lecture, as I noticed, on sensitivity analysis, and particularly sensitivity analysis as it's conducted in any logic. Um, Sensitivity analysis is itself a substantive uh, and larger topic that I really don't have time to explore in enormous detail here. And broadly speaking, we can kind of taxonomize it in, in multiple ways. Um, talk about one way sensitivity analysis, sensitivity analysis of how a model behaves when we change, say, a given parameter, a single parameter between different values. Um, or how it might change if we change multiple parameters at the same time. Recognizing that with a nonlinear model, those, those effects are not necessarily additive. Those effects don't necessarily um, combine in an obvious way. Um, so we'll like to take a look at how these two are articulated within um, any logic. Turns out there's variations on these. For example, multi-way sensitivity analysis exhibits what's called the curse of dimensionality. Um, 
as the number of parameters that you're seeking to vary goes up, let's call it n, the number of possible combinations of values of those parameters you want to examine goes up as some constant, call it a to the n. Um, so if we have two possible values for parameter a, two possible values for parameter p, they exhibit four altogether. If we have a parameter c where you just have two, kind of the minimum number to have variability goes from four to eight, and then from eight to 16, et cetera. So there's a set of techniques known as, for example, Latin hypercube techniques, which seek to, um, uh, seek to examine a uh, thorough subset with respect to any one variable, but don't guarantee all combinations of values are examined. Um, there's a, a technique known as orthogonal arrays, um, which uh, has a sort of similar flavor. It's guaranteed to examine all pairs of, of um, uh, variabilities between uh, the different um, parameters. We don't have time to go into this in, in detail, but suffice it to say, with multi-way, you have some computational challenges once you get many, multi is large. Um, a second issue is, what are you varying in the sensitivity analysis? Is it purely parameters? So you're adjusting parameter values and seeing how much of a difference that makes? That's a very common, that's the most common and, and uh, perhaps one of the easiest forms of sensitivity analysis to focus on, what we'll be concentrating on today. But there's also structural sensitivity analysis. Here, we are changing our assumptions as captured in model structure. So when it comes to an agent-based model, for example, this may have to do with changing the structure of a state chart. Instead of having you know, a state chart where we collapse you know, people who are, um, who are uh, infected with and assume that all of them are infectious, we disaggregate it into two different states, or vice versa. Um, so, or you know, asymptomatic and symptomatic, instead of collapsing them and assuming that uh, uh, people pretty much through this phase are symptomatic, we'll, we'll actually divide them up and see how much of a difference that makes in model results. So we'll do a kind of quick, as we call it in software engineering, spike prototype. We'll try roughly putting in values and just see how much of a difference it makes if we change that structure. Um, another type of thing we'll, we'll see a little bit um, within our description is the type of variation. Are we examining single alternative uh, values, say for a parameter, or are we drawing, or perhaps I should say systematic alternative values for the parameter? Um, examining it, for example, as it increments between zero and 10 for the duration of, um, of immunity a month from chlamydia. Um, and instead, in other cases, we want to do Monte Carlo analysis. We draw a parameter from a distribution. So we might say, well, this parameter, if you go look at meta-analyses you know, by Holditz on the duration of BCG immunization, or the impact of BCG immunization, um, there's, uh, there's some me measure of variability among high-quality studies. And we will try to go from uh, the statements of the variability of those studies in a meta-analysis to a uh, distribution, a probability distribution, that will then impose on this parameter value. And we'll draw values from that parameter distribution, running the model again and again and again. And we'll see derivative uh, parameter uh, uh, distributions, uh, probability distributions, or histograms, approximations of those distributions, imposed for the model results. Um, so in other words, we feed in distributions for parameter assumptions, so we get out distributions on model results. That is something that's very readily done with any logic, and we'll see how we accomplish this. Um, here, I should note that I am uh, commenting, uh, I've been sort of emphasizing this idea that, okay, the parameter has some unknown value in the world, and we're just characterizing that unknown value as a draw from a distribution characterizing it as a random variable. There's also possibilities where it may vary over time in an uncertain way. And um, we've actually seen a little bit how to do that uh, last time when we looked at uh, stochastics. And, and really, that's a matter we could, we could describe that as a parameter within the model, which is itself drawn over time from a distribution. I'm concentrating here on sort of there's a static value for it. Um, 
So here's stochastic processes, ongoing change versus static. Parameter retains its value all through. So if I were to try to uh, accomplish all of the uh, discussion of all of these, it would probably take a couple lectures. We're going to be going through um, at a high level, and if people are really interested, I could, I could have a, another lecture that goes into more depth on some of those issues. Um, okay, so uh, suffice it to say that um, there's uh, often a, a focus within, um, within sensitivity analysis, predominantly on parameter sensitivity analysis. We have to remember that often there's uncertainty about the model itself about sort of how the system works. Uh, our dynamic hypotheses um, are couched in uncertain terms. And um, structural sensitivity analysis uh, plays a role there um, as, as far as varying the structure of the model to see the results um, from that. And often, and a very important question we'll come back to with in the discussion of calibration is, when we do the structural sensitivity analysis, how does, that in, how does that relate to calibration? And indeed, how does sensitivity analysis with respect to parameter values relate to calibration? Um, should we simply take a calibrated model, and we'll discuss what that means um, in the coming lecture, probably the very next lecture. Um, should we take the calibrated model and do sensitivity analysis on it, or should we do sensitivity analysis and for each alternative assumption, say about model structure or even about parameter values, should we try to recalibrate the model given that? It's a non-trivial question and sometimes it may be desirable to, do, to take it either way. So the idea being that um, we want to see, well, let's, let's vary the structure of the model and then let's see the best possible uh, set of values that are consistent with this by recalibrating. That could be very effective in some cases for having a sort of alternative dynamic hypothesis for what's going on. On the other hand, often we take a model that's already calibrated, we perform sensitivity analysis just to see, you know, for the sake of different interventions, if they were to vary these different parameters, what would the relative level of impact be? If we could increase parameters by, uh, these parameters by 10%, for example, what would the impact be on model results? Um, I think I'll leave the discussion of, of um, predictor corrector models for a later time. Um, so um, we're going to be looking at um, uh, variation within um, within <coughs> parameters and within initial states. And um, the thought here is that um, uh, some difference, some measure of uncertainty in different parameters, for example, or in the initial values of throw that into that term more broadly, have hugely different impact on the outcomes of the model. We may have some parameters where there's really very, very little um, impact on the outcomes in which we're interested. So a 10% change of parameter A may have almost no notable difference on the outcomes of that we're monitoring or on the the choices we're trying to make. It may be that for whatever value of the parameter that seems plausible, for example, decision A seems to yield better results than decision B. Yeah? This is kind of a big picture question. Yeah. Going back to the purpose of the model. Yeah. And so I started with, you started with a question, but yeah. it, I guess I'm just having a hard time seeing why if I started with a question and I had a, the parameters that Yes. So now I built my model, yep. and then I start trying to uh, do my uncertainty analysis with it, right. and I find out that it's not having an effect. Yes, okay. So that's a very good question. Um, and I'll see if I can do it justice. Um, so there may be some parameters which, um, which are reflective of processes that are captured in your model. So, so we have these models, and these models uh, attempt to articulate some sort of mechanistic description of, of how relevant factors, relevant processes operate in the world, right? What are sort of the governing factors within these processes? How do they play out over time? And sometimes we have a sense of the factors that are involved in those processes, but we're not, one of the reasons for making these models is because we're not 
we're not sure about the um, relative degree to which particular components of that process actually end up impacting the things we care about. We know that it's somehow involved in the picture out there, but how much it's really driving the factors we care about, we're not sure. And so we put it in there because it seems to be a plausible, a plausible first guess about what may be driving it. But when we put it into a model and we really hitch things up in terms of how they seem to impact each other in the world and, and put it into a bigger picture that, that really captures the things we care about, sometimes those things don't seem to have that much of a difference. And indeed, in the next version of the model, you may want to strip that out as an unnecessary detail. And so we often do this sort of little dance where we put something in, maybe we do it in a very um, gracile way, that's not quite the right word for it, but uh, a very lightweight way where we put in a rough estimate and, and we see um, is this having much of an impact? And if so, we, we invest the time to have it more. Sometimes we build it in from the start, we do due diligence collecting the parameter values, and, and we find post hoc that it's, it's actually has a very modest impact on anything we care about. And often that what we care about is, is either a, um, a description of sort of uh, the, the behavior of the system over time going forward, for example, or the trade off between policies that are relevant for the decision making, right? Um, and uh, it sometimes happens that it's not that important. So we, the next version of the model might, in fact, choose to downplay that factor, choose to put that aside and say that we won't need to represent that. You know, we don't need to do further work. But um, I think there's an important, uh, th that's the important aspect, one of the important aspects of modeling is that you learn to, you, you have a first guess about what's most important, and then you refine that by observation. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an aspect of, of, of learning. So um, often here we're, we're trying to identify these parameters or initial states that are really important. You know, I've done a lot of work, for example, in a TV model, um, going back to reports from the 70s to identify estimates of the number of individuals who'd received BCG vaccination based uh, back then, number of individuals uh, who have positive TST tests, et cetera, and, and really sweating some details of kind of the historic context out of the belief that that is probably shaping some of what we see in high burden communities now, because some of those individuals are younger then or middle aged now, and it may still be playing a role. Um, sometimes I find that that initial state makes in fact very little difference after the fact. And so then, uh, it both causes me to be more confident about my, that my characterization of it is, is, is reasonable and also to put my effort into some other place, you know, put my effort into other sorts of data gathering. Um, so often with this sort of uh, sensitivity analysis, conceptually speaking, and sometimes in terms of the actual um, <coughs> descriptions, we use tools like spider diagrams that describe, you can imagine each of these as a parameter where we have varied each of these, say, by 1%, and we use a diagram like this to summarize how much the, say, an outcome of interest has varied because of a variation in that parameter. So some, some outcome, some, for a given outcome of interest, some of these parameters elicit a large change due to a 1% change, that parameter around some, some sort of default value, and others exhibit quite a bit smaller change. So this is a spider diagram that can be used to describe sort of the impact of, of uh, parameter um, variation on, on results. You know, we've also done in our published work, um, this an older, older examination, um, systematic parameter analyses, uh, sensitivity analysis, where we go through different age groups, for example, different sexes, looking at um, different types of behavior that we might be able to modify. This was for smoking behavior. And asking what sort of level of impact do we have on, this is quality adjusted life years here, in terms of life years saved in the population. The idea here being that it's 
quality adjusted life years, life years being a, a quality measure of the number of years of life saved over some population, and here they're adjusted for the, the quality of life. So we're seeking to not only add years to life, but life to years. Um, and here we have what can be viewed as kind of a sensitivity analysis that actually was uh, part of our published results. Um, so it's not necessarily purely something that gives us a sense of what modeling choices to make. It's something which may be of interest to the broader community in terms of summarizing impact. Um, okay, so what I'd like you to do is uh, reopen this model. It's in the example, the sample models are example models in any logic, SAR and Asian brace calibration. This is the model we saw last time when we were looking at um, looking at the um, uh, Monte Carlo 2D histogram and the issues of uh, variability, stochastics, within the model. And I'd like you, once you open it, to click on the Monte, uh, uh, Monte Carlo whoa, sorry, uh, 2D histogram experiment within that model. So I'll go see if I can fire it up here. Uh, I think I already have it loaded, yes. Um, it's, it, it's complaint uh, gives it away, there, there it is. And I was futzing around uh, when I was trying to decide what, what slides to put in here. So um, uh, here it is, it's SIR agent-based calibration. And if you go double click on this guy here, you'll see this, um, uh, this quantilist um, diagram. Um, does anyone remember what this is? What is what is this structure that we see here? Yeah, it's a it's a right. It's a Monte Carlo two D histogram. So it's a it's a um, chart actually that displays data from a uh, histogram two D data set. Um, and each of these, you'll recall, each of these dots, which here are thrown down in a sort of um, modernist interpretation. It, each of these dots um, or is a cell, or each of these sort of little boxes is a cell, which summarizes the number of trajectories that fell for this small interval of time, where the values of those trajectories for a given quantity of interest fell between sort of this level of value along this axis. So if this was number of infected people, this would suggest there's a certain number of trajectories darker, so probably quite a few, which um, whose value at that interval of time, say mean value at that interval of time, fell between maybe it's about 900 and 1,000 people who were infected. Okay? Um, so we saw that last time. And um, we're going to build on that today to help understand the impact um, or to interpret sensitivity analyses. Okay. Um, so when you double click on this, what you'll notice is that um, the initial statements of parameters uh, for that histogram, and I've got to, um, I was preparing these slides, so I've got to go back and restore these, I think, to their original value. But it should be fixed. I think initially it should look like this for you. In other words, it specifies for this experiment that we're going to use fixed values for all these parameters. And we last time had something along this line. What, why did we do this? Does anyone remember? Why would we have been looking at variability in results if we had all sort of fixed values for these expressions? It was because we were looking at variability due to what? Yeah, it was stoch underlying stochastic. So given the same values of those parameters, you still have variability. And we saw that it was modest, but could make the difference in some cases between an infection that never took off and one that did. Um, in other words, one that just petered out after one or two or three people getting infected versus one that took off. Um, here, we're going to be looking at something different. We're going to be looking at varying these things. Um, and what we can see specifically is that for each one, we can pick whether it's a fixed. So, so I selected varied in range here. And then given that, we can either select a parameter value as, as fixed. We're not going to be varying that. Or we could specify it as varying in a range according to some systematic variation. And uh, there's a small set of limited options um, available. So I'd like you to select for the very first of those, average illness duration. 
select uh, range. And I'd like you to select um, uh, <coughs> a minimum value of 5, a maximum value of 5, and a step of 5. Okay. Um, so that yields 5 different possible values for this. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. It's going to systematically examine the results of varying that parameter starting at 5, successively incrementing it, 10, 15, 20, etc., with, with this step of 5. Right? Um, so this is a, um, a so called range um, uh, variability. And you'll notice here that when we selected this varied in range, that we did so, and when we did so, this number of runs thing, which had been visible before, is now uh, grayed out. It's now disabled, in the words of, of a UI. So um, I, um, I'll try to just uh, highlight that now. When we had this, remember we set the number of runs? And actually, any logics little information on it said 100 runs and we pointed out it's actually 200. Um, so that is something that we can set um, here quite explicitly. When it's varied in range, um, we, don't, we don't have that option. Uh, instead, it's implicit. It's implicit in the variability we exhibit um, or that, that we're requesting, the ranges we're requesting. So let's run that thing. Um, uh, so let's run it and uh, we will so to see what results from that variability. So it's 100 replications, but that's not relevant anymore. How many replications do you think it's going to run? How many simulations is it going to do here? Well, does it look like a large number or a small number? Small. And I'd say it did five. Where did this five come from? Yeah, exactly. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. Um, so, this is what I'm saying about the number of runs being implicit or derived from, implicitly specified by the ranges you specify. Okay. Yes. Can you do twenty-five Yes, you can. Um, so you'll recall that. Um, that last time I argued that there's a, any logic uses in a somewhat non standard terminology a threefold um, characterization of the um, hierarchy of, of runs to be made. So um, there was, on the one hand, an experiment. On the next hand down, there was a simulation. The next thing down there, they have what they call a replication. And I said replication is more commonly used, at least in my, my neck of the woods. Uh, we use the term realization, a realization of an ensemble. Um, so it's, it's a particular run of the model with a specific random number seed, particular sort of uh, um, uh, stochastics associated with it. Um, it's a draw, as it were, from, from a distribution associated with the stochastics. And, uh, and here, um, what we're examining is a situation where we're running five simulations, each of which is composed only of one replication. And because any logic articulates this division, it is possible to have multiple replications per simulation. Okay. So in other words, um, and I think this is a very perceptive thing that Paul is asking about, because what we see here is a set of trajectories, but the, the clear question to ask is, well, how much of this variability that we see here is due on the one hand to the parameter bearing versus on the other hand to the underlying stochastics, right? How do we know that if we <coughs> ran one of these five times, we wouldn't see a similar measure of variability? Maybe, maybe the variability we see in the parameters just washed out by the variability in stochastics, right? Um, so that would be a, a good way to articulate that. Of course, there's other ways of investigating. I mean, you could you could run five, you know, uh, realizations for a given w one single one of these and see the measure of variability. In fact, let's let's do that just so we get we we get uh, what the heck we can um, uh, exercise a little bit. So we'll do it with five here. Well, it's uh, on a value of uh, 15, and we'll run it. 
sure, we'll run it 200 times, right? This is what we really did last time. Um, and we saw some measure of variability around it. Um, so it was filling in. And, and indeed, there's, there's different trajectories being filled in. Um, but broadly speaking, they're clustered in a way um, that those others weren't. What we saw is kind of a, a, a progression that was systematic there. A progression was, in fact, dominantly shaped by the variability in the, uh, in the um, um, variation of those parameters, variability in the parameters, rather than variability due to stochastics. So, you know, we could run this out till, uh, till 200 or indeed till the cows come home. And uh, what we'd see is that uh, it's actually reasonably tight in, in, in terms of the variability. Yeah. Right. So um, there's a. Um, I'm going to be talking about that issue in our in our uh, calibration um, uh, calibration time. Um, but I'm just to say that we'll see there where. So if you go in and you. Um, look at, and I believe it's uh, in advanced here. Um, so there's this um, uh, before simulation run and after simulation run um, uh, component here. And we'll see basically how you can use that to shape the number of realizations, OK? Um, I'm not going to address it right now. I don't have the slides for that and so on. So. Well, we're going to have to come back to that. But I'll make sure that that's answered within our, our calibration one, OK? Um, because it's a major point. Because in calibration, as you can imagine, where we're trying, to we're trying to match the model output to some datum, we want to we wanna understand how the model output is, is variable for a given set of parameters, how it varies, um, so that we are matching up, indeed, against um, for the best parameters, not for just the best chance of, of uh, stochastics. Anyway, so um, we'll come back to that. But uh, the parameters here are varied within the range. And um, we can do a, a range this one. We'll put it back. You'll notice it remembers the values we put there. Now what I'd like you to do, so that's a one-way sensitivity analysis. For multi-way, we're going to examine the results of changing multiple variables at the same time. Um, now, what you have to be careful about here is that um, when you're examining them uh, in this way, whether they're, you're doing so in a Monte Carlo way or with systematic variation, there's often an implicit assumption of independence going on. And sometimes, well, you want to think in general, OK, am I missing out on some kind of variation between these? Uh, for example, if you had a model and you were varying interest rates and unemployment independently to see the results in terms of you know, municipal finances, um, you might want to question about to what degree can you really assume that both of those are independent. Um, at the least, you want to interpret the results with some caution there. And you might want to simulate some underlying factors, for example, economic situations that would influence both of those. So uh, just bear in mind that multi-way, you don't always just want to examine both independently. You want to think uh, about whether you're missing a third cause that's, that's impacting um, several of the things being varied. But let's, let's impose a separate uh, range to explore on infection probability. So we'll set that to a range. And this one's going to have 11 possible values going from 0, uh, excuse me, uh, 0 to 10. What, what, am, I, what am I doing there? Um, uh, make it 0 to 1, uh, step point 1. Um, uh, I was out to lunch. Um, 0 to 1 and a step of point 0.1. Um, so here, this has, um, this has uh, 11 different values. Um, and what we're going to do is look at the intersection of those two. So if we were to run this out with, with that being specified, how many runs do you think we're going to have? OK. Um, anyone want to hazard another guess? Let's see what it turns out to be. What's the jackpot? Anyone want to guess? 55. Where'd that 55 come? 
Yeah, it's five five times eleven, and 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 that that's because we're varying both at the same time. Um, this one, and we're examining again all possible combinations of them. So conceptually, we have sort of a full factorial type of situation where we have uh, you know, one of these things varying along uh, five. summarizing it in terms of output, right? Um, so uh, this is the result we get. And it's kind of washed out. Can you see it better on your screens? There's actually a fair bit of, of structure up here that I can see in my screen um, of, of runs that, that went up here. But hmm, what, what's, this, what's with this line at the bottom? What do you think that represents? Sorry? Yeah, those are points. And so what this is actually saying is that um, if you examine all combinations of these, most of the realizations, I've got to be careful. Most of, uh, most of the probability weight, if you think of this, remember I argued that every, every sort of a little increment of this, I think of maybe it's some size, um, what do we have? 40 of these, so every, um, no, probably more than 40. I can't remember how many we had along this axis of the bins. But every bin along here, if we sliced it for a given interval of time, it's basically a histogram. Basically a histogram coming up out of this. So these boxes are coded to how, how high the count is within that histogram at this time, you know, what number are here and what number are further on here. What we see is that it's kind of a long-tailed histogram. The vast amount of the weight is here, and then it sort of declines precipitously, but then you have this kind of long tail that goes way up here, um, and so on. Now, again, what this is obscuring, what this is not letting us see, is that for a predictor or particular trajectory, is it the fact that these are simply taking longer time to come out and then they go up? Or is it indeed that most just never go up at all and then some go up? There, there's a difference there. I mean, um, in other words, it could be that some remain here for a long time and then peak later um, versus, you know, other just a large number that stay totally flat and then only some come up. I think it's more the latter. I think you have this very sort of uh, uh, divergent situations. But uh, suffice it to say that these histograms have the vast majority of the weight here and then a long, a long tail. And you know, if we want to explore this further, um, we could. I mean, I can see on my screen that there are actually, you can kind of see there's, this number is small enough, um, it's 500 here, that, or sorry, 55 here, that you can, um, you can actually see individual trajectories. Can you see those on your screen? sort of things etched by individual trajectories. So there are some that sort of play out here, some that still go up here, some that play out here. There's actually a larger number that this is a little bit thicker. Um, so there's, of those that take off, they're, they're taking off up here. So this is a multi-way sensitivity analysis and perhaps surprisingly suggests that once you look at combinations of these, the vast majority are kind of weighted down here. So, you know, if you were to try to summarize, um, if, if you have active outbreaks that you're trying to reproduce here, um, you know, a whole regions of the space would probably have very little, um, very little chance of an out of an outbreak. So, um, in any case, that's a simple examination of multi-way sensitivity analysis here. Um, right. Uh, okay. So. Um, we're going to now be examining the issue of imposing probability distributions on parameters. So uh, what we've been doing is examining systematic variability in, in, these, um, in these parameters. We're going to take a look at imposing a probability distribution. So how do we draw parameter values from distributions? And um, here we're going to
to run the model many, many times, many, many realizations, and each realization is going to use a different draw from the probability distributions. And as a result, you're going to get a probability distribution of all outputs. What we've been seeing here is not probability distributions, it's, it's output from many, um, many particular runs of the model with systematically varied parameters. Here we're going to be imposing distributions. So to do this, what you're, you're going to do is go to the parameter section and go to the freeform area and, and uh, put in a, uh, an expression. These after all are just Java expressions. So we're going to put in an expression for, um, for these values. So, um, so here, average illness duration. Let's, let's go put in a, um, a uh, distribution here. And I have a distribution there, but maybe we'll start with a, a very simple one. Maybe this is a uh, uniform distribution um, from 0 to, what was its original value? It was, it was 15, right? So maybe from 0 to 30, say. Um, so we'll draw it from a uniform distribution here. Uh, and we can then run it. And here, that parameter will have a distribution uh, imposed for it. Uh, and you can run that out. And indeed, we'll again see the sort of uh, weight effect towards the bottom. So what we're doing here is we, it's kind of like we're feeding in a distribution for the parameter and seeing what distribution pops out for the results. Um, quite straightforward. We do this obviously with respect to an arbitrary number of these parameters at once. So. Um, here, each time the model is being run, this draws a new value from that uniform distribution between 0 and 30, and imposes that, runs the model up for one realization, summarizes the results, and goes on. Okay, um, okay. so uh, let's go stop this. Um, just to emphasize uh, that this is an arbitrary expression we can put in there we may want to impose more, something more like a, um, a normal distribution. So what I have here is a normal distribution with um, a, um, mean, I think it's a standard deviation of five. Uh, is that, a, is that a, a mean of five and a standard deviation of 15? Um, it's an awful large standard deviation and a, and a, a minimum of, of zero, it turns out. So you can do that with a max of zero so if it's less than zero, it'll be zero. Otherwise, it's whatever is drawn from this distribution, normal, 115. So here it's a truncated normal, truncated, so it doesn't go below zero. Um, and uh, just as readily, we could we could draw that there. Um, run it. We'll again see. Distributions or, or histograms over time. So a set of sort of successive histograms here. Um, and each of those histograms is approximating some underlying distribution, uh, which results from this distribution we can put for this for the parameter. And here we have the luxury of specifying you know, how, many, um, how many times does it run. And if we did this with respect to multiple parameters at the same time, each of them will be drawn independently from these distributions. Uh, and and the, the whole thing will be run. Okay, so um, here we have a, uh, have a case of, of uh, Monte Carlo based analysis. Let me ask this. Um, if you were to, um, one feature I probably should emphasize about this. Uh, so we, this is sort of an illustration of the earlier point I was making about very sort of uh, set variable sensitivity to outcomes. So um, that uncertainty associated with the parameter, relatively speaking, it had a, a rather bigger impact on sort of the width of the underlying distribution around time 40, if you look how big this is, um, sort of how wide this distribution is, than it does by time variability in this parameter might not have as 
big an effect as variability is something else. But if you're looking further out, the, the width of the histogram out here is a testament to the fact that that parameter starts to starts to really have an impact. And indeed, this if if, if I were to give a, a couple lectures in mathematical epidemiology, you, you'd understand that this has a lot to do with the phase of the epidemic evolved. Because what's going on out here at this phase is predominantly driven by the spread of the infection person to person. It's not as much driven, there's some impact, but it's not as much driven by people's recovery times. Um, and out here, what you have is, and in fact, the reason the whole curve turn, uh, turns around, if you think of it from a stock and flow perspective, um, at this point where it starts uh, declining, you have either at an individual level, the effective reproductive number going below one. In other words, a given infective on average will infect fewer than one person before they recover. And so the number of people who are getting infected goes down. Over here, each infective might have been recover infecting two people before they recover. So it spreads really quickly. Um, it's kind of like uh, before they recover, they've left two people to replace them. And each of those people leaves four. Or each of those people is two, therefore four overall. Um, over here, what you're getting at an individual level is few people infected before someone recovers, because there's few enough um, people susceptible still around. But um, more tellingly, at the population level, what you get is more people recovering than are getting infected. Hence, the number of infected goes down and declines. So from a stock and flow perspective, which incidentally is a very effective way of thinking about the dynamics of agent-based models, even if they're not implemented in a system dynamics term, the, the, in terms, the, we can still think about the stocks and flows involved, because there are stocks and flows involved you know, by which we could characterize these dynamics. Here we got this decline because people are recovering. And the um, amount of time that it takes for someone to recover becomes really, really important in this phase. If they're recovering more quickly, this is going to be declining more precipitously. Um, if, they're, if it takes longer for them to recover um, from infection, then it, it, this it's going it's to take a longer time before it really gets um, very low. There's going to be more infectives around for a longer amount of time. So it's no accident this becomes really, really wide the histograms considered as sort of vertical slices through here become much wider in that later phase of the epidemic. Um, okay, so uh, that's an example of sort of differential, um, uh, differential sensitivity. Um, if we were, by contrast, if we were to look at infection, chance of infection probability, I would, um, uh, I would vouch, well, you know, that would be actually an interesting thing to do. Well, let's Let's um, throw a caution in the wind here and uh, let us go and put a value back for 15 there. And let's draw this. What the heck? Um, let's draw this from a uniform distribution um, between 0 and 1, something like that. Um, by the way, I could do, do this. Java allows me a lot of, or the, any logic library allows me a lot of choices. Unfortunately, the autocomplete doesn't work here for whatever reasons. And so, um, when you're trying to remember the names, um, sometimes you want to go sneak off somewhere else and try it and then paste it in here. Um, this is going to be uniform between 0 and 1. Uh, and we could run this. When do you think this will be most pronounced? Infection probability. Yeah, I think that's going to have a, a pretty big impact on how long it takes to, 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 how long it takes to take off. Um, yeah, so you get... Um, Basically, it's going to have a uh, a large impact early on. I mean, the takeoff times here are are really quite variable. It's it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing because they're not they're so variable they're not even stacking up effectively. Um, but there's a lot that are taking like out, out here to take off out to here up here. So there's actually quite a bit of variability early on. What you see there is the concentration of them um, at that point. But but this concentration belies the fact. It looks like it's declining, but a lot of this is some are just taking off there, some are just taking off there, some are just taking off, and those are going the top ones that are coming down there. And so this again, you can't really look to this 
histogram type measure to capture the the trajectory of uh, you know particular trajectories. Um, but um, here, what you see is actually a huge amount of variability through any event. In fact, the area of greatest variability is right about here. You can't. It, unfortunately, it just doesn't show up well on the screen. But there's a huge variability where this is a, this is uh, spread out very thin and hence very light over this region, and it actually then declines uh, as it's more and more driven by recovery. Okay. So, uh, in short, um, we we have. Uh, different parameters which have different degree of impact at different times or different phases of an epidemic. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you can read out um, I believe you can get the median out. Um, you should be able to get out uh, something very close to the mean. Uh, basically, you could read out a histogram, and I believe the envelopes around the median. Uh, but I'm not certain about like if you can actually, as a point estimate, read out the mean from it, or if you just have to deal with the histogram and sort of average things accordingly. I, I'm, I'm not certain about that. Um, it wouldn't be hard data to get if you had to do it manually, but it would be really nice if you could extract it. Um, I'll try to remember to look into that if someone could remind me. But, um, but you could certainly read the data out of the Monte Carlo 2D histogram object. And in fact, there's a, well here, let's, let's just, um, just go see how you, how you would find out about that. So go to any logic help and go to um, uh, 2D data uh, object. Um, Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's always a nice thing, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, so we'll, we'll let this accumulate. What I was going to look at, um, uh, I'm, I'm an old fashioned sort of guy. Um, and. Uh, and uh, I go to the, the, the class, okay, this is the class reference here. Um, and uh, this is specifying, okay, now this is, this is interesting because there's actually a, should be a, um, a specification that's actually rather more detailed than this in the, um, let me just change the scope, um, no. Um, there, there should be a specification of this in the library information as well, and I'm not sure why this is not uh, showing up. I'm wondering if the class has a different, a different name, name to it. But let me, let me try Chris's uh, great suggestion here. Okay, um, come on. Um, I see. So copy all, and and then if you went to or something like that. Let's see. Okay, let, let's go see. Uh, here's Excel. Uh, here's his Excel. Um, okay, you know, you folks don't want to look at my tax information. Um, okay. <laughs> they're, they're. Okay, so, so these are, what do you think these things are? Um, let's try to figure out what, what these things are. So um, we know something conceptually about what this data object is accumulating. We know what's displaying, and I argued that it was a set of histograms for different intervals of time. Each of those histograms is divided itself into a bunch of bins. So what do you think these things are here? Right. Those are the times, yeah. Um, so probably something between zero and times 2.5 just sort of summarizes what number of trajectories had their, probably their average value fell within what? What are these guys here? These are the, yeah, so these are the number of factors. These right. are the bins. So 7,800 to 8,000, 7,600 to 7,800. And, um, oh, okay, I see. So this is from, yeah, 0 to 2.5, 2.5 to 5, et cetera. And um, what you'll see is this is just the count. Right? Right. Yeah, that's the exactly what you do there. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, uh, yeah. this is. But, but I mean, just conceptually, <laughs> in terms of what you're varying, and then you just, it's, it's got the fill in. So it's got the range that's right. on one side, that's right. and what you're varying. That, that's right. So here we have time. Right. Um, and again, I, 
I want to emphasize that um, this is not, this is a, a set of successive histograms with respect to this quantity over time. Right. What we're not doing is doing histograms sort of over time for each of these things or what have you. Um, but uh, yes, these are histograms themselves and these are the histogram values. So, you know, the mode of this histogram, I don't know, maybe it's, it's probably by mode, it's probably a giant mode down there too, but, but you know, there's a mode here. Um, and uh, you can read that out and that will give you at least an approximation to measures of, of uh, variability in central tendency. You could, you could do an empirical mean on that. That would probably be reasonably close, right? Um, and you could read that out, put it to a database, or put it to a, uh, to a file um, in the same sort of way. I, I suspect that this would, if we turn this into a value, um, we could, um, well, here, what, what the heck? Um, let's, let's try something. Um, uh, let's, let's, just, um, let's just try, okay, so if you go to that, um, and you go to advanced, um, uh, then let's, let's scroll down here, um, okay. Right. Um, so if we were to do here, um, so what we what we want to do, and I'm looking if that would be the best place to do it. Um, I think it is. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, ah, yes. Um, incidentally, Deval, this is is where you enable replications. Um, replications for uh, for each of the things. You can specify the number. Um, but uh, I believe this is actually the best place to do it um, in advance. And if you had after iteration, this is confusing sort of this uh, uh, thing with iteration, but I believe that this is going to do it. If we did, um, let's just try um, trace LN and, and turn this into a uh, two string. Um, I wanna see what this thing looks like when it's printed out on the console. I suspect you might be able to get some variable or tab separated variable format. So let's just start running it. Ah, there we go. Look at that. It's it's uh, it stands arrayed before us. Um, so so here, this looks to me tab separated. It didn't give me quite what I want. I wanted to do it at the end, but instead it's doing it after after each iteration. I'd have to frob that. Um, but uh, in any case, it looks like you can very easily programmatically extract it as a tab-separated variable um, array, which could then be read into Excel or whatever, um, MATLAB, what have you. Um, okay, so R would happily eat that as well, I think. Um, okay, so we can get a Monte Carlo output with respect to runs and uh, after all runs. Um, okay. Um, it bears emphasis that certainly often we don't know the exact state of a system at an at a initial point in time. So, you know, sometimes what you do is sensitivity analysis to vary the initial model state. It's not purely about varying parameter values, but sometimes your assumptions about the initial state. Now, in aggregate models, this is often simpler task because there we have a small, typically, number of state variables. And small is a relative term, but <laughs> it's a lot smaller than the number of people in our populations in an agent-based model often. And so we can simply set the number of people, in, uh, the, the initial values of those state variables. That could just be a parameter. And indeed, you can perform the sort of sensitive analysis we're doing here. And actually, a little bit more sophisticated ones um, involving Latin hypercubes and so on, and Benson, for example, for your system dynamics models. Um, and you can vary the initial values of stocks, and you could, you could uh, calibrate them. In agent-based models, the state has far larger dimensionality. And you know, realistically, you're not going to be creating hypotheses about, is it Joe who's initially infected, or Jane, or, or Sam, or at least not, not in, most, in most cases. So here, sometimes what we do is we modify the numbers of people, or the fraction of people with certain characteristics, or the locations of those people, but avoid, um, uh, avoid sort of imposing um, uh, different assumptions about exactly who starts in what state and in examining all variations of that because it's, it's too large. 
So um, initial state is something we'll sometimes examine vari variability with respect to. So we're going to come back to this. This is kind of the second in three lectures related to um, examining uh, uncertainty in models and dealing with that uncertainty and using these 2D histograms for, for understanding the impact of model variability. Our next lecture on this general topic is going to be on calibration. And that might last, uh, no, we'll probably finish within one of these three hour sessions. Um, though it might last for, for much most of that. Um, in any case, uh, so uh, any questions on this before I go on to discuss and, and look at the clock here? Um, I think we'll do the, the quick, uh, his, uh, the, the quick uh, hierarchical model, um, see how that's done. The question, yeah. So, um, I was wondering how you would look at the case in a Right. Um, okay, so, uh, so help me understand. Um, what you're seeking here? Are you seeking, um, like, uh, having Sorry, a histogram yeah. for at a particular point in time? A characteristic right. at a particular point in time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that should be quite easy to. Hmm. Hmm. Aha. Okay. So I'll I tell you what. I guess what I'm trying yeah. to get to is, yeah. um, so, so let's say we wanted to see how the um, spread of the infection would happen over time. Right. Um, and you want to know like the margin of error, so at that time, then sure. Sure. what's the number of people who would get infected? Right. So you want to know the trajectory of each replication over time. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not. Plot like the cumulative number that got infected, sort right. of the attack oh, rate, yeah. or something like that. The, the cumulative attack rate, yeah, or the, the attack so rate. So I guess yeah. we would have the data set that you're yeah. kind of resetting each. Correct, but but the key thing there, or a key thing that you want to consider, <coughs> probably you take into account, but I want to emphasize is where would that data set live? Um, I'm not asking for uh, an address. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm asking for sort of where, where in the model would it be found? Okay, the, the, the reason it can't be in Maine, um, so, so there's a reason it, it can't, be, can't be in Maine, um, uh, M-A-I-N, not M-A-I-N-E. Um, so uh, <laughs> so uh, the reason it can't be in Maine is because it needs to, um, live beyond uh, each realization. And Maine, Maine um, for all the many virtues that recommend it, it, uh, it, it dies, it, Maine disappears between each run of the model. So, so let, me, let me see if I can make this point, because I think it's an important conceptual point, and it bears on some of the things we saw with this model last time, okay? And um, let, let me just take a few moments um, to do this. So. Let's first run this run this model and reflect on what we see. First of all, I'm going to get rid of 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 this um, thing where I had it print out um, print out this. This actually didn't give me oops quite quite what I wanted, but um, uh, it's so I'm going to uh, well okay. First, I'm going to point this out. Um, we saw this last time, and I argued that there were two statements here that had a function. Um, and I, I uh, tried to articulate what that function is. Does anyone remember what this statement is? This says before each experiment run, it says data infectious 2D dot reset. What does that do? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. It, it basically wipes off all data that's stored in that 2D histogram. And what I argued is that if I ran this model, and you folks don't have to do this, but if I, if I were to, to run this model, um, and uh, maybe I were to run it to all 200, or maybe I were to start partway through it, okay? Um, uh, and, and like this, and then I were to run it again. 
I'm going to run it again. And that's when that reset gets gets put into place. That's when that it says that, that reset before each experiment run. I'm now performing a, a run, and so it's going to do a clean slate, tabula rasa. Wipe it away and reset. Okay. Um, that, that, that one did, but it's really this other one I want to draw your attention to. It's this data infectious 2D dot add root dot infectious DS. This root, what is this root here? What is that, to what does that root refer? That root refers to a main object, okay? Um, so uh, if you go over and you put your mouse over this little uh, thing here, uh, what you'll see is use root, the active object class, root active object class. It turns out that's, that's main, okay? So what is, this infectious DS lives in main. This is saying, hey root, I have a reference to this main uh, say, I'm going to get from an infectious DS. That's a data set that lives in main. And that data set is accumulating over time in main the number of infectious people. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, I had answered that in respect to, I think, David's question last time was, how do we know this is accumulating the number of infectious people and not the number of susceptible people or, you know, uh, what have you. And it's because infectious DS lives in main. We could see that it lives in Maine because if we click up here, um, and there's a there's an issue with the I see. Okay, good. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that it's not it's not always Maine, but I'm having trouble coming up with a case where it's not Maine. Okay. Um, Correct, correct. So, so uh, this is, root is actually specified. I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds of the roots here, but, uh, but if, if you go to general um, main active object, see it says main active object class and it calls it root. Now, <laughs> the deal is that main is just a name we give it. Um, we could call it stage or we could call it home or we could call it world. And so I'm referring to it as main, but the, yeah. functionally it's the root, okay? Um, now I've never seen a model where it's not called main, um, but but um, you know uh, the the point is it serves as the stage on which the agents move, and that's its default name. And you'll notice within main is infectious DS. It's a data set that accumulates the number of people who are infectious at any given time. And what I argued, Duval, was that last time, this, this, um, this uh, statement here took this value, so it, it, it got this, it got this reference to the main class, the root, and then it got this data set, and it added all the information in that into its own data. But where does this data set live, ladies and gentlemen? Where, where is the home of that data set? Yeah, it's actually in here. And that, and the reason it's there, the reason it's there is not because this, this is particularly privileged and these sort of things have to live here. The reason is, I mean, you could go put this in an agent. You know, each agent could have this Monte Carlo 2D histogram carried around with him or her. Um, but the reason it's here is because it needs to accumulate data across realizations of the model, okay? And when a given realization runs of this model, what's going on is that this main is coming into existence. A new world is born. That world plays out. And just before, and, and when that, run, that world finishes running, this happens. And then that world disappears. Main, that, that particular root disappears. And it will, it will run it again. And it will run it again. And, and so this before simulation model is, is when the world is yet new. And um, it's the dawn of the world. And this is the dusk of the world. Um, so so this, is, this is short. This is where it has to live. So anything, Duval, where you wanted to accumulate information between realizations or between different simulations of this model, would have to live 
within within this space because the main is, is ephemeral in the grand scheme of things. It comes to existence, it runs out with a particular sort of um, uh, stochastic trajectory, and then it's going to disappear. And so this is why you have to salvage its data before it disappears. You have to salvage this data from it and squirrel it away in this experiment. Because the experiment is over, is, is sort of the, the um, uh, it's like it, it's in charge of the multiple worlds. It's in charge of running it again and again and again. Does that make sense? So you would have to have it live there. And I would argue, although I won't do it now for lack of time, I would argue that if you went down here and you went to analysis data and you went and got a histogram data object and you were to put it into your Monte Carlo 2D, uh, sorry, into this experiment. Let's not get distracted by the name. If you were to put it in this experiment and you were to, after each each run of this, if you were to take some piece of data out of root, out of main, and you were to stick it into that histogram, I think that would be accumulating the sort of data you're talking about. Does that make sense? I mean, um, what we're starting to see here is that main, you know, main to us was kind of the world before, but it's the world only for a certain run. And now we're dealing with dealing with statistics that have to be summarized, data that has to be collected between runs. And so hence, hence the experiment is a longer running uh, construct than is, uh, is main itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I just ask a question. Yeah. So yeah. This puts So, so um, I'm just th no, this is a very good question. And I, I realized that that was a, last time when I looked at this, I realized that that was a gap I hadn't tried to fill thus far. And I, re I rued it um, la last time. But I'm, I'm going to try to unrue it right now, okay? So, so this, main, um, uh, this main has a variable called n infectious. And it counts the number of infectious individuals, okay? Um, and um, and it has this. Uh, excuse me. The infectious DS counts the number of people who are infectious, and this is just a variable, just a variable here. And the question is, where does that value come from? By the way, why is it a double? It should be an int. I mean, it shouldn't be a double. But um, uh, wh where does this come from? Okay, folks. Um, how would we, remember we actually put in place a mechanism to count the number of infectious people one time. Do you remember how we did that? Yeah, yeah. And so we had a, sta a statistic which we defined for the population. Remember that? We could define for the population a statistic and that counted up the number of people who are in a certain state. Remember that? Okay. That's one way to do it. The problem is, let's suppose we were doing that for five different characteristics. Um, the number of people are infectious, the number of people are susceptible, the number of people are, you know, are asymptomatically infectious or symptomatically infectious, the number of people who are, who are um, you know, vaccinated, the number of people who are recovered, the number of people are, who are uh, susceptible. If we were to do that, um, uh, each time it's going over the entire population. It actually would be going over the entire population to count each, okay? And that's kind of inefficient, right? Um, to be looping over this. Now, maybe that's not a barrier, but maybe sometimes it is. And so, that was when we were doing, the, uh, if we were doing population, okay. it, 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 with the statistics on population, okay. they'd be looping over it. Okay. So, I'll tell you what this model does to avoid this, okay? And you could think of it as a little hack to avoid that. Um, Okay, so folks, when you have an infection go on, oh, okay, uh, maybe, okay, there we go. Do, do you see what stands before me? Um, if you go into the, the, this uh, infectious state, what happens is when someone comes in here, it increments the number of people who are infectious. When they leave, it decrements it. Ladies and gentlemen, this, in short, is keeping track of a high-level stock. 
that's computing the number of people. This is manually, this is manually recording. I'm just flowing into the stock and I'm leaving the stock. It's maintaining that variable. This get main, what does that do? You folks have seen it many times now. What does this do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically, I'm, I'm this person and I say, hey, get my main, get, get my, get my main main. <coughs> um, and so it gets the main associated with me, um, right? It gets a reference to that. And then I can ask that reference, hey, give me, give me your n infectious and increment it. And so that's what that does. And when, then when I leave this, when I leave this, it knows, okay, you're no longer infectious, so I'm going to decrease this. So that is how it maintains that variable, and then that variable is, is, um, is sort of uh, measured by, periodically, this thing here um, with a recurrence time of two. Yes, it would. Yeah, it would. It would. In fact, I'm tempted to do it, but time is a fleet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, that should work. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, you'll see this pattern quite a bit in some any logic models. They, they'll have these variables um, there that are essentially stocks and counts, um, and they'll increment them when they come into a state. And by the way, there's a very good question you could ask, like, why not increment here? Like, why not increment it in this transition? And you know, part of the answer is, well, if you had many transitions coming in, for example, maybe you'd all want them to be in one place, one that increments, one that decrements. Anyway, but that's, that's a little bit of a distraction, but I hope that makes sense. Yeah, okay. It's good to know there ain't no magic there. You know? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, that is, uh, uh, that, that is related to our uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, any final questions before I uh, transition over to, let's, let's stop this so we can save this.